Hey, this is Mike Moschek, Head Walleter. Thanks for tuning in to Fun Finance Friday Industry Conversations. We've got a good segment for you today. We've got Taylor Johnson of Naveen uh, visiting with us. It'll be good to hear the borrower's perspective of how things are going in the market. Uh, also, today, Friday the 7th, is the deadline for registration of funds under the Cayman Islands Private Funds Law. Uh, I chatted with both Maples and Walkers and got very good optimistic reports towards the end of the week on the uh, registration process. The lender side law firms also reported that things seem to be proceeding smoothly in their view. So optimistic that uh, nothing to see here, so to speak, and, and this issue will come off the table next week. I uh, also want to give a shout out and congratulations to Sammy Asoli, who started at SNBC this week. Uh, great guy, great banker. Uh, congratulations on the new role and congratulations to SNBC on the good hire. So with that, uh, let's visit with Taylor. Great. So today we're lucky to have with us Taylor Johnson, who is in the domestic capital markets group at Nuveen Investments. Taylor, how you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? Doing great, doing great. Thanks for joining us. Sure. Where, where, where do you live? What city are you in? Uh, so I'm based out of Newport Beach, California. So no hurricane on your uh, agenda for this week, huh? No, nothing today. It's about 75 and sunny, so uh, no yeah. complaints. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Well, we had a hurricane on the East Coast, but it's passed by now, and so I'm happy to have some good weather, and I'm outside for the day. Nice. Great, great. So tell us a little bit about your role at Naveen. So I cover all of the financing and debt strategy for Naveen's domestic mandates. So that's about 18 mandates in total, and that's about $53 billion in equity with about $13 billion outstanding in debt. And that covers anything from uh, multifamily, retail, alternative assets, um, as well as office. And industrial is actually covered by a different group out of the Dallas office. Great, great. And remind everybody, if, if you don't mind, the history with Nuveen and the relationship with TIAA. Sure. Uh, so obviously over the years, there's been a number of name changes relative to the names of the firm. Um, but back in 2014, TIAA acquired Nuveen Investments. And essentially, this was a move to strengthen its asset management and distribution platforms. And the goal between um, of the goal of that acquisition was to basically create a separate subsidiary within the TIA family that would handle all of the asset management business. Uh, so as a beneficiary, Naveen Real Estate is able to distribute its products through the Naveen distribution channels. Great. And what are, what are the key investment focus areas of the firm? So Naveen covers a number of different product types. So that's fixed income equities and alternative assets. And under the wider Nuveen umbrella, um, alternative assets includes commodities, agriculture, farmland, infrastructure, as well as real estate. And with real estate, uh, Nuveen real estate is focused on the major food groups, which are multifamily, industrial, retail, office, and then other alternatives, which would include things like hospitality, um, senior housing, single family residential, and self-storage. So switching to fund finance a little bit, you guys do use a lot of subscription facilities. Tell us about how you're using them to create value for your funds and for your investors. Sure. So typically we use subscription lines mainly when we launch a new fund or mandate, and it's usually to help deploy capital without burdening investors with capital calls and sort of really creating a very smooth experience for investors. Um, additionally, we use it as a way to kind of, delay starting the return clock as it relates to investments and sort of the accounting side of things. Um, also, we use it to manage liquidity and help reduce cash drag. So at any given time, if we're preparing for an acquisition, we're not sitting on cash. Um, or alternatively, in a market like this where markets are sort of up in the air and there's a bit of volatility, it's a very ex inexpensive alternative to typical project level debt. Um, and we've also been using it recently to bridge to kind of times where the markets open back up, such as dealing with retail maturities. And what, what about letters of credit? Are you guys a big consumer of LCs? So we've used them a bit in the past when there is some type of need for a you know, TI or LC reserve. More recently though, we haven't been using those uh, just because there hasn't been a need, but certainly familiar with that product. Yeah. 
And what about NAV facilities? Are you are you using any leverage at the fund level? Um, to date, we have not actually used a NAV facility. However, in a time like this where we have you know maturing debt on retail, we're also looking at uh, potentially instituting this kind of product for maybe some of our debt funds to kind of deal with you know the kind of tightening of the repo market. Uh, it does make sense, and it's something that we've been kind of exploring a bit more over the past couple of months here. Has the COVID disruption created any challenges for any of your existing facilities or changed the way you've used the facilities? Yeah, so definitely I'd say just with the COVID-19 narrative, one of the things we've been dealing with for some of our existing facilities is the entire syndication kind of expansion process is a little bit tougher. So as we look to kind of increase our availability on a going forward basis, we've had a number of constraints from the banking sector. Uh, the first of that is duration is a bit harder to achieve. You know, most terms are kind of capping out at the 364 day facility mark. Uh, durations up to, you know, two or three years are a little bit harder to find. Additionally, every single bank is very focused on ancillary business. So apart from just the facility itself, every bank is looking for additional deposits, or um, other fee generating lines. Um, and then lastly, I'd say the banking sector is really focused on clients that have you know, immediate needs. So the concept of having availability for you know, things that are maybe more opportunistic or speculative is kind of sort of by the wayside. Uh, the banks have been very focused on you having you know, upcoming maturities or portfolios that you're actively looking at, um, very concrete need, not so much um, things that are a bit more speculative. In terms of how this has affected our use, given that we put in most of these facilities last year, you know, with the decline in the one month LIBOR rate, the facilities are very creative. So we're trying to utilize those as much as possible, just being the cheapest source of capital. And then I'd say additionally, we've been utilizing them for bridging to other hopefully better debt markets or paying off existing debt for assets that you know, maybe the market's a little bit tougher for retail, as an example. Um, so that's generally how that's changed over time. Are there any financing needs where you've had trouble finding a lender in this environment? Um, I'd say, so back to the sort of facility and sort of the unsecured side of things, definitely we are struggling to get longer term than, you know, 364 day from the typical banks, and that's on a term loan basis or unsecured. Um, as you can imagine, mall debt is challenging as well. So dealing with any type of maturity in the mall space um, has been tough with pretty much the you know, freezing of the CMBS markets. And then I would say, lastly, subscription lines. Um, typically, that's usually a slam dunk. But I would say more recently than ever, the amount of bids for these has been lighter kind of than in past markets. So Definitely, we've seen a number of lenders, particularly banks, kind of pull back from, you know, these typical products. Yeah. And what, what about how you're thinking about fund finance going forward? Do you see any change in your strategies uh, that you've learned based on COVID? Um, I think with the Fed's kind of active role willing to support the economy and sort of keep rates suppressed, uh, you know, one thing that we plan to do is continue to maintain our foot and rate exposure. Um, and another thing that we're thinking of as we think about floating rate exposure is maintaining our flexibility to sell assets if markets continue to decline or there's some type of disruption. Um, additionally, I'd say going forward, we want to increase our availability on our sublines in case there is any kind of further uh, volatility or kind of tightening of basically bank capital. And then uh, lastly, I think we want to pursue a couple of NAV opportunities where it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, do you need to, you know, bring the NAV opportunities into new funds where you have negotiated the leverage bucket with the investors or do you have some availability in some of your existing funds? Um, I'd say it's a combination of both. So there are some seasoned funds that do have, um, you know, significant amounts of equity where this would make sense. And then to the extent there are other funds where maybe there's something we need to kind of run by our investors to kind of get their buy in. Uh, that's also on the radar. Yeah, that's great. What are some things that the banks could do a little better to increase their value for you? 
Um, as we kind of look forward into 2021, I think one of the sort of things would be helpful, which we've been talking to several banks about kind of initially, uh, would be something along the lines of a SOFR pilot program. Um, that would be just a way for, you know, to kind of go through the experience of borrowing on a SOFR based product and working out some of the kinks. Um, I think many firms like ours, we have a significant amount of filling rate exposure. So at some point, sooner or later, we'll have to deal with this. Um, and the idea is to deal with it with a smaller aggregate commitment rather than dealing with the entirety at the same time, kind of next year. Um, additionally, you know, we've had a lot of conversations with some of our relationship banks to discuss ways in which we can work with some of their clients. And this could be anything from you know, restructuring some of their distressed assets or looking at potential sales. Uh, just really tapping into the bank's client base to potentially look at ways, you know, we can be a provider of rescue kind of capital or maybe partner with some of um, their clients that need help. Yeah. And lastly, uh, one of the big challenges, I think, in this market that banks are mostly focused on is their credit processes have just simply been slammed. So getting things through credit and approvals, uh, credit's been playing a large role today in, in the bank market. Um, Making things kind of move a little bit quicker and kind of where we were pre-COVID would be great. Um, but just any kind of additional pressure on their credit committees to kind of either relax things or expedite processes would be a huge help, from my opinion. Yeah. I mean, we're definitely seeing some things take a little bit longer. You know, I, I think there is some inevitability in this environment that banks are going to be a little bit slower. Um, sure. But certainly, I, I take your point that to the extent the process can be driven faster, I could see how that would be very valuable for the borrowers. Sure. Yeah. Well, Taylor, it's great to have you on. We appreciate you joining us. Sure. No. Pleasure to be on. Yeah. Great. Well, hopefully, we'll get you involved here in some of the FFA events that are coming up. I think the, uh, the market would benefit from hearing a little bit more from Naveen. Yeah, that'd be great. Great. Good. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, thanks for dialing into this week's Fund Finance Friday industry conversations. I'm going to take off uh, next week for a week of vacation, but uh, we'll, we'll have a good episode for you. And I look forward to catching up with you later in the month. If we can do anything to make these sessions more productive for you, please send me an email. Thanks. The material and information contained in the podcast is for general informational purposes only. Any use of the audio within this podcast without the express consent of Cadwallader is prohibited. Quotes from this podcast may not be used without the express permission of the speaker.